Well, if you want to be a skier, let me tell you what to do. You got to have time, like a month or two. And plenty of money, just a little bit more. And I don't mean hundreds, I mean figures of four and a savings account. And you need a mountain, preferably high, with a lodge and a pool that's right nearby. Trails and runs and a good long toe. And something else? Oh, yeah, snow. Plenty of it, brother. Tom Anderson was born on March 7, 1937, to Joel and Phoebe Anderson of Minneapolis, Minnesota. His father was a successful design executive and photographer at the Brown and Bigelow Printing Company, which produced Boy Scout manuals and all variety of calendars, including the work of Norman Rockwell. Their work hung on over 50 million walls across America, from kitchens to filling stations. Tom's little sister Joan was born in 1939. Then his little brother Greg followed in 1948. Greg was a bit of a surprise for his parents. I'm kind of a double mistake, because not only was I 10 years after my sister and 12 years after my brother, um, and this would be back in 48, my mother's 42. She said, if I'm gonna be 42 and pregnant, it better be a girl. <laughs> um, but I had a, uh, a nice childhood. While creating the family Christmas cards, Joel Anderson recognized Greg's marketable good looks and soon put him to work. I was cute when I was young. <laughs> but I had, I had fairly curly hair, and, and so I would pose for some of these calendar pictures when I was very young, and I really didn't like doing it that much. But later on, he would say, well, someday you'll thank me, and it turns out I got paid a little bit for some of these calendars. Greg was more inclined to follow his big brother and sister as they explored the great outdoors. We grew up in the banks of the Mississippi River, and there really was a bank, and you could go sledding and toboggan, and a lot of us would put skis on, literally the, the little wooden ski with a leather strap over it. Got my skis all waxed, I'm ready to go. My favorite memories of childhood is uh, at the lake home. My father would, would take me water skiing two or three times uh, a day all summer long. My father's uh, legacy to us, he had polio as a child, so he couldn't do a lot of the uh, athletic events. But he wanted us to do sports that he couldn't do. It was more that we learned to play tennis, and ski, water ski, and snow skiing. And there was a private school called Miha Academy. And we all went to that school. Uh, my brother, I think, got a little bit more in trouble. Uh, he did something with the pulpit, because it was a religious private school and we had chapel services. I don't know, somehow he took the pulpit and, and took it outside and tried to hide it, and I think he got in trouble. <laughs> And I, I wasn't the best student, but I was a pretty good B student. I was goody two-shoes. I, I, I played basketball, and that was an important part of it. Tom and Greg began skiing with their family in Aspen in 1954. And Greg remembers their introduction to Aspen Mountain, which would play a prominent role in their lives. My brother and sister were supposed to take me skiing. It was probably one of the first times on Lift One. Uh, they went up, and I was behind, and, but they were supposed to be behind me and supposed to accompany me, and I had to have an adult supervision to get on there, and they wouldn't let me on the lift. I'm now six or five or six years old, and so I just spent the rest of the time walking around the town in my skis on. I think he got in trouble for that, but my big brother's been taking care of me and making up for it ever since. <laughs> After that rocky start, Greg learned to keep up with Tom, and he came to share his athletic older brother's love of skiing. I guess we came here every year, and those two pictures of us skiing together, I like this. This was by Franz Berkel. Obviously, he had much better form, literally. I uh, followed him down when I was six or seven years old, all the way till probably last year uh, or two years ago. He would go first, I would go second, and then we would wait for our, my sister, who would be way behind. <laughs> Tom's love of skiing influenced his career, and Aspen was always at the back of his mind. Like so many of us, he worked odd jobs in Aspen between semesters at college. One of his first jobs here is a taxi driver. He drove a limousine or a taxi between Denver and uh, Aspen, and my mother wasn't very happy about that at <laughs> all in the wintry roads and the old single lane, uh, two lane highway. But he, he also was a pin setter uh, at the two lane bowling alley, which later became a restaurant called The Shaft, and now it's Boogie's. In 1960, Tom married Janney in Minneapolis, and they honeymooned in Aspen. 
he went in the ski business right away and started a little ski hill <laughs> for kids. But then soon got into the business with Obermeyer and uh, other ski shops. And he started at, at uh, Dayton Ski Shop and started his own ski shop called La Ski Hut. And it was, I believe it was at that time that he said, you know, I, I worked hard and I need to spend more time with my, young, my two young daughters. And I think that within a short time, he sold the business. And so he moved to Aspen. Next year, I showed up on his door. <laughs> I just followed my big brother out here. After relocating to Aspen in 1971 with daughters Debbie and Jill, Tom and Janney became volunteers at the Aspen Ski Club and made many good friends. Tom served on the ski club board for several years and was elected to a term as president. He became an FIS race timing official and volunteered for 20 World Cup races and took on the huge responsibility of chief of race in the early 1980s. Their first business in Aspen was a children's sports shop called Peanuts. Then in 1980, Tom purchased Pomeroy Sports and made it into a popular community asset, which he ran until his retirement in 2013. Janney recalls that Tom loved being around the people, and he often said that was what he missed most after closing the store. Tom's contributions to Aspen ski racing earned him a place in the AVSC Hall of Fame in 2013. He was honored as Aspen Winter School King the same year. Everyone you meet has a story about Tom's reply when asked about the skiing, even under the worst conditions. Best day ever, he would say. Their father had urged Greg to go to law school, but a short visit with Tom after college turned into a decades-long career of community service when Greg discovered his passion for social work. He volunteered at the community church, then went on to help start some essential public services with Helen Klanderud, including the Open Door, the Aspen Counseling Center, and Mind Springs Health. And that was during that time that I also uh, started a, the Buddy program here. Uh, I had been a big brother a couple times in college and graduate school. Over 40 years, the Buddy program has become an essential Aspen organization, serving countless young people and their adult buddies. It's become one of the best programs ever, thanks to a whole lot of people, and particularly Lenny Wineglass and, and what he's made of it. It's just, in, it's just become the best uh, model Big Brother program in, in the country. In 1978, opportunity knocked in the form of an underutilized chapel at the edge of town. But there was no income or anything. There wasn't one soul connected with the Aspen Chapel when I got there. Does everybody here know what the original name of the Aspen Chapel was? It was called Prince of Peace Chapel. When I would call Greg to new office, I would hear, good morning, this is the Prince of Peace. <laughs> had to giggle and made it clear to Greg he had only been here for a few weeks and he already thought he was the Prince of Peace. The chapel's founders envisioned a non-denominational open door policy. This suited Greg perfectly and while working full-time he studied to become a Methodist minister and eventually earned a PhD in divinity. So we used to say, because there's no insiders, there's no outsiders, and we're open to, to everyone, and to have dialogue with a lot of different uh, religious leaders of different faiths was very important. Well, it's been almost 37 years, 36 and a half years. So I did everything here, including, you know, vacuuming in between weddings, making sure the boiler's going, making sure the lights are down. They, were, they always gave me a hard time about that. So I was minister and janitor always at the same time. One of Greg's proudest achievements was to revive the Easter sunrise service, which has been a tradition on Aspen Mountain for over 30 years. There had been a sunrise service that Frank Harvey did a few times, but it took a long time to get up on Aspen Mountain and they did it for sunrise. <laughs> I believe it's 1986 when the gondola went in. Then when we did it up there, a lot of people came. It's more than just an Easter sunrise. It's a real community celebration of life. One of the low points of my career got the biggest uh, uh, publicity <laughs> of anything. I was very privileged to uh, do a, a wedding service for a celebrity named Sonny Bono who lived here in town. There were tons of celebrities in the chapel. I certainly said uh, Sonny and 
uh, Susie uh, throughout the service, but just one little place during the service I happened to say, do you Sonny take share? And at that moment there was a pause that seemed like a lifetime for me, but an explosion of laughter. <laughs> Even Sonny was, was laughing at that point. And of course it made headlines everywhere. Ministers miscue in Liven's Bono wedding. And it was on many other publications and even on The Tonight Show. Around 2002, Greg fell in love with Carolyn Etheridge, a parishioner and part-time employee at the chapel. I became officially engaged to, to Carolyn uh, many, <laughs> some 10 or 12 years ago. When Tom was diagnosed uh, for the second time, when leukemia had come back after being in remission for a year or so, um, I went, I got the call and met him the next day in the hospital. Uh, and as soon as I walked in the room, we, there was this poignant pause. We didn't say anything or didn't know what to say. And he just came out and said, well, I want you to do my memorial service. And I said, well, I'll do your service if you do my service, my wedding service. So we needed to expedite that, and we thought of doing it during Easter. All the whole congregation repeated after my brother, will you, Greg, take Carolyn? And I responded to them, and those continued in the vows and the pronouncement. So we literally did have the community uh, marry us. It was a beautiful Easter uh, morning, on, again, on top of the, the mountain. He's attended the, the chapel quite often. And, but he would say, one of the reasons I like coming to the chapel instead of the other churches is that I can always find a seat here. Greg and I have had kind of a long battle over the years on who worked harder. <laughs> that kind of went nowhere. <laughs> but Greg always accused me of never working. <laughs> All I did was take bike trips, sailing trips, fishing trips, golf trips, and when I was home I skied every day. <laughs> when Greg told me a little over a year ago he was going to retire, I said, Greg, you're not even 65. I'm 76, I'm still working. <laughs> and besides, when you do work, you work one day a week. <laughs> You know what made me real happy it was two Sundays ago when I sat down in the queue and opened the bulletin and I saw the title of Greg's message, 1,880 days. Sundays. Days. I didn't say Sunday. I immediately did the math, and that is equal one day a week for approximately 36 years. Well, it's been a bit of a challenge, obviously, for me to be here as I guess I'm both a, a brother and a, and a minister uh, for this role right now. And it's apparent quite quickly to us that Tom's memorial service should be on top of Aspen Mountain. He has been part of this mountain for 65 years. If you see a track in the powder white snow, catching a trail neath the sky, then look for a skier whose heart's in the clouds, and the song in his heart tells you why. He soars through the spaces, he flies through the trees, he races the wind rushing by For here is a man with his spirit fulfilled An eagle who must ever fly For his skis are the things that give him his wings And make him an eagle on high Everything I've, I've done, to especially initiating a few things here, after I left, it always got better. <laughs> and I, I, I could say, well, that's a real humble thing. To, I don't mean that at all. I'm just very happy that it had a foundation 
to, to, to flourish uh, and to, to keep going. So that makes, that gives me even more gratitude, you know. I think I'm gonna, I've already enjoyed my first year of retirement. It's been great to have a, a break, especially after being a bit of a workaholic and uh, doing all that, but to uh, go in another phase of life would be terrific. And still being able to help out at the chapel a bit, I'm very grateful to be called Chaplain Emeritus. That was nice of them.